All right, so uh, my topic today is money under laissez-faire, and uh, the main intent of the talk is to uh, give you an understanding of how money develops, or how at least it could develop, in an unregulated setting, in the absence of government intervention, as a product of spontaneous market forces. And, uh, and here, what we're up against is the same sort of misunderstanding that has uh, in the past, and still to some degree at present, prevented people from having a proper understanding of the origins of law, morality, language, and, and many other social institutions. The, oh, there goes my uh, slides on the monitor as well. I think we're having a complete breakdown. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, the tendency is for people to assume with money, as they have tended to assume with some of these other institutions, sorry about that, that, uh, that uh, orderly monetary systems have to be created from, uh, uh, from a central, by a central authority, have to be top-down arrangements. And so we have these ideas about a benevolent dictator or vote or whatever being the source of our monetary systems, including the most basic forms of money. So what I want to start with is how the very notion of money, that is of a generally accepted medium of exchange, how that itself isn't anything that requires the intervention of government. On the face of things, it is admittedly not easy to understand how you can have a common agreement, especially among a large number of persons, about some small set of goods or entities that should be generally accepted in exchange. We owe it to the famous Austrian economist, the founder of the Austrian school, Karl Menger, uh, that we can now understand how it's possible for a monetary standard to emerge without any deliberate interference or decision from on high. I uh, teach, uh, taught for many years money and banking, and uh, among other things, needed to teach my undergraduates Menger's theory. Uh, and I found that the best way to do that, believe it or not, was not to talk about money at all, but to talk about jelly beans or something like that. And so I want to, uh, you to bear with me while I offer you the same explanation of Menger's theory that I gave to, for so many years to my students. And that explanation was in terms of something that's known as a Paglia urn experiment after a statistician named George Paglia, whom some, some of you may have heard of. Suppose we started with... Uh, an urn, which was opaque, so you can't see what's in it, and inside there are jelly beans, one of each, of different colors. Let's say they're 15 jelly beans of each one of a different color. And we pass that room around, that uh, urn around the room, along with a big bag of jelly beans of all colors, and ask people to draw blindly from the opaque urn and then double replace, that is, put back the bean they drew out along with another one of the same color. And suppose we did that experiment here and you all passed the urn around so that each of you had an opportunity to draw from it, let's say, three times. If we then took that urn and dumped it on this desk or on a table and looked at the beans, what do you suppose we'd see? Anyone? Equal numbers? Now, we'd have one dominant color. Believe it or not, the same tendency that explains the fact that there'll be a dominant color in that Paglia urn experiment can, uh, can help us to understand how money can evolve spontaneously. What's the analogy? Imagine that we're a bunch of traders. We have about uh, a bunch of different goods we want to trade with. We don't know which of those goods is going to ultimately become generally accepted. In fact, we have no concept that, that any of them will eventually uh, uh, take on that characteristic. So each of us experiments with exchange. We already know that the good we want isn't something we can necessarily trade the good we've got on hand for, right? We lack what William Stanley Jevons called a double coincidence of wants, which would otherwise make direct barter a simple solution for us all. 
So our thoughts run to what good we might get our hands on that then we can more readily exchange for what we want. So we start thinking, what's the most saleable good in the economy? We don't know, and perhaps there really isn't any yet. However, through our individual experiments, we actually, and our consequent willingness to trade for certain things even if we don't really want them, we actually increase the saleability of the few things we start experimenting with. And so long as it's possible for others to discern even, even very um, vaguely that some goods are becoming more saleable than, than the rest, then there will be a greater tendency for those goods to be chosen by other persons trying to affect trades. And what will happen eventually is you'll have an accumulation of probability in favor of a smaller and smaller and smaller set of goods until it's perfectly obvious to everyone that certain goods are becoming generally accepted and those goods be evolve as a monetary standard. Does that make sense? Now, Menger's theory is often misunderstood. Menger did not suggest that money evolved in the pristine fashion of, uh, uh, of his theory or my poly urn experiment without there being some preconditions that favored certain things becoming money. It wasn't really as if all goods were starting out uh, at the same starting gate in a kind of monetary horse race. Rather, they were goods that had a certain prominence to begin with, perhaps because uh, they had a symbolic value, or they were prized for other things. They were used as gifts or uh, 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 for other purposes. Nevertheless, the fact is that the, the prominence of certain goods, as well as their physical characteristics, the fact that that may have given them a head start in the monetary horse race, or that powerful, influential kings or religious authorities uh, attach special values to these things, that of course would only make the monetary evolution uh, take place that much more rapidly. But it doesn't, doesn't contradict the underlying power of Menger's theory, which is a theory that tells us that there is a tendency for money to evolve from any, in any society where there are useful gains to be had from exchange. And the government does not have to be involved in that process. Of course, uh, the actual evolution of money occurred in prehistoric times. We, we find very few non-monetary societies that we can look to where we could actually observe money evolving spontaneously. But there's one important exception to that, and that's POW camps during uh, the wars. World War II in particular has been studied in this respect. The prisoners in POW camps are, for the most part, deprived of the monies they would have used in the outside world. They do have goods, however, which uh, until the end of the war would arrive rather regularly in the shape of Red Cross parcels. I'm thinking of allied prisoners, of course. And they, not all the prisoners cherished all the goods in the same way, so there were opportunities for mutually advantageous exchange. There were also barter problems, so it was useful, it would be useful, if some common good could be adopted generally as money. So there you had something close to an experiment in the evolution of money. And the point is we know that money did evolve. It, wasn't, it didn't evolve because the chief commanding officer told the, troop, the prisoners what to use or anything like that. In fact, it evolved on its own. Cigarettes were commonly what were chosen for the purpose, but there were instances where other goods played the role of money as well. Okay, so we don't need an edict, a leader, a vote, or anything like that to have some valued good emerge as, a, as money, as a generally accepted means of exchange. But of course, uh, the fact that money evolves spontaneously or can evolve spontaneously would also lead us, and the way it evolves, would also lead us to predict that very different commodities might have de become money in different parts of the world at different times. And this is exactly what anthropological evidence shows us. This slide 
uh, gives an example, a very small sample of the wide variety of real goods that have served as money in different societies at different times. You're all familiar with many other examples, tobacco in the American colonies, wampum, and so on. There is, in Menger's theory, by the way, and here it's important to stress that we mustn't confuse the fact that monetary institutions can evolve spontaneously with the fact that they become, that, e that they evolve perfectly spontaneously. There is in Menger's theory, in fact, no suggestion that the best conceivable money will evolve spontaneously. There's a big role for accident in his process. If some goods are most prized at the beginning, they may become money even though their features, their physical features, don't make them ideal. It's possible, nevertheless, to extend Menger's theory in a manner suggesting that, after all, there is another evolutionary story at work that can tend to weed out the worst monies, the ones that are least efficient, while favoring the survival of the fittest monies. This isn't Menger's theory, this is my own, but allow me to present it for what it's worth. Imagine, for example, that you've got two isolated economies. In each of these economies, the forces of, described by Menger's theory lead to some good evolving as money. But if the economies are completely independent, there's no reason why the same money should emerge in both economies, the same good should be adopted as money, even if, even if the same goods are in fact available for that purpose on both in both economies. Now let's assume for the sake of argument that the two economies are at first perfectly identical in their initial endowments and therefore perfectly, they're, they're, they tend to generate the same amount of product and wealth. But let's assume that the money that emerges in one economy is more efficient than the money that emerges in the other. The, tra the costs of transacting with it are lower, the waste involved in holding on to it, storing it, or just packaging it for monetary use are lower. In that case, that economy will tend to grow more rapidly than the other economy. Now, uh, so far, that has no bearing on this, the now smaller economy, but the next stage in the story is one that you would think would eventually occur. The explorers go from the larger economy, usually, to the smaller. It could happen the other way around, but it's more likely that the resources devoted to exploration and all that are greater in the more prosperous economy, and eventually, that economy comes in contact with the less developed one. And at this point, the Mengerian evolutionary process, which had come to a halt in the two isolated economies, starts over again, because now there are opportunities for trade between the two now combined economies. And in that case, of course, the horse race is between only two potential monies. Which money will win? the one that already has the larger network. So that money will take over both. And if the hypothesis that the money uh, that was most efficient created the bigger economy and therefore the economy most likely to lead the exploration and, and combine with other economies is correct, then you can see that you have a tendency, it's not perfect by any means, but a tendency over time as the world becomes one big economy for more efficient monies to prevail and less efficient ones to die out. Well, we all know that the precious metals, gold and silver, became very widely used monies and presumably their, uh, their uh, efficiency, their characteristics of being malleable, relatively homogeneous, having relatively high value to weight ratio and so on attributed to their success. But there is one clear disadvantage to gold and silver as monetary commodities. And that is that unlike some of the other goods you saw before, like cowrie shells or certain kinds of animal teeth, they don't come in naturally occurring units, right? 
I mean, a cowrie shell is a cowrie shell. They're mostly the same size. You can imagine having different sizes that you attach different values to, but it's prepackaged, as it were. In the case of gold, it comes in dust or nuggets, and it has to be packaged into convenient units that represent a definite quantity of the commodity in question. In other words, we need to make coins. And here again, there's a lot of misunderstanding about coinage and about the role of government, the necessary and proper role of government. The usual assumption, or at least an a claim often made, is that money was the invention of some ancient rulers, like Gyges of, uh, 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 in, in Greece or uh, 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 any, any number of other uh, uh, Cre Cre King Croesus, uh, who's shown here. Uh, this is all myth as far as students of numismatics are concerned. We know that the first coin-like items came from Lydia in uh, Asia Minor. We don't know who made them. The markings are for the most part anonymous. There's no reason to assume that the first, these first proto-coins, to call them that, I say proto-coins because they, they didn't have any uniform weight, but they had markings. Uh, there's no reason to assume that they weren't private inventions, private innovations. What's that? Oh, this would have been around, uh, I think we're talking about the 5th century before Christ, 6th, 5th or 6th. It's nevertheless the case that governments took over the coining of money in ancient times fairly early and made for themselves monopolies of coinage. Uh, the question is, why? A conventional answer, which is an answer that lies at the foundation today of what we might call the myth of the need for state control of money, is that governments took over coinage because private coinage would have resulted in the deterioration of coins, in the production of shoddy coins, and hence in the corruption of monetary arrangements based on coinage. But that's not at all true. The primary motivation behind the establishment of coinage monopolies in ancient times, which would also be the primary motivation behind the establishment of monopoly banks of issue in later times, that is, monopolies of paper money, was fiscal. It was uh, done in order to take advantage of the fiscal advantages to be had by having a monopoly of coinage. Because a, a king or prince with such a monopoly can take advantage of it to pay for the troops, for example, even though tax revenues and other resources don't uh, result in the acquisition of the necessary precious metal, it's always possible to, for a monopoly coiner to redefine the standard as having a lower quantity of metal than before and to thus make a given available quantity of metal go further in settling debts and paying off obligations. So the combination of a monopoly of coinage and the royal power or prerogative of determining what is meant by the standard monetary unit amounts to a fiscal device of tremendous power and, uh, and uh, tremendous capacity for abuse, of course. The abuse of the silver standard in Rome is notorious. Here's the amount of silver in a Roman denarius. Let's see if I can, you can I think you can make out those dates uh, reasonably well uh, over a relative, over the course of uh, semporal, several reigns. The denarius went from having a fairly high silver content, being practically pure silver, to having hardly any silver in it at all. And this was all for fiscal reasons. There was no, uh, there's no making a story here where the, coin, where the uh, reduction in the silver content of the denarius served the aim of promoting a sound monetary system. Now, it's often said that even if it weren't for fiscal motives like the ones I've described, private coinage wouldn't work because, according to Sir Thomas Gresham, whose picture is shown here, bad money will tend to drive good money out of circulation. I'm sure you've all, all heard that claim. Uh, 
the phrase itself, by the way, doesn't come from Gresham. It's meant to be a paraphrase of some advice he gave to, gave to Queen Elizabeth. In fact, though, Gresham himself did never implied that competing coin, coiners would, co competition in coinage would result in the prevalence of bad coin over good. Quite the contrary. When he was advising Queen Elizabeth about how quote, unquote, bad money drives good money out of circulation. He was referring to the consequences of the debasement of coinage by Henry VIII and how that had resulted in the loss of all the formerly more heavy gold co uh, silver coins from the kingdom. Gresham's law doesn't apply to a case of competition in currency because in, in a free market in coins, coins are valued according to uh, private subjective judgments which will in turn be based on their actual metallic content. And then in fact there is no, if we, if we apply conventional economic theory to competitive coinage, we find we've got no more reason based on that theory to think that bad coins would outcompete good coins than we have today to think that a producer of number eight Phillips head screws that are actually not standard will win out over one that, that, is, that produces screws that really are standard. When you go into a hardware store with a nut for such a screw, you can be pretty sure the screw will fit. Why is that? You don't even know who the manufacturer is, right? It's because market forces tend to punish manufacturers of shoddy products when standardization of products is, is important especially. But we don't have to rely on theory, we have evidence. Every now and then governments have relented and allowed private coinage to take place. And when they have, the evidence overwhelmingly shows that the result has been not bad money taking over, but good money. One example in the United States, the Beckler Mint. The Beckler Mint, which was located, by the way, not very far from here, produced its own private gold coins during the so-called Appalachian Gold Rush of the 1830s. At the time, there was no U.S. mint except that in Philadelphia, and the transport costs and other factors made it prohibitively costly to send gold back to Philadelphia to be coined, so there was a need for local coining services. In fact, the quality of the Beckler coins were so good, you could compare it to the products of the, Royal, of the uh, Philadelphia Mint, they were up to standard and in many respects superior to the standard of the Philadelphia Mint, and they remained exceedingly popular for many years after the Beckler Mint was, forced, uh, was closed down. In fact, it was shut down after they created a branch mint here in Charlotte to supply the area, then they uh, forced the Beckler Mint out of business. In California, you had the same thing happen. I'm sorry, I should point out that on this previous slide, the, the first column is a Beckler gold coin. The last two are products of two California mints that were among many that uh, arose during the gold rush. Once again, the quality of the coins of the private mints, or rather of the private mints that survived for very long, was extremely high, and it ultimately took punitive measures and the establishment of a San Francisco branch mint to force the private coinage, coiners out of business. In England, and I've written a whole book about this, so I'm going to force myself to not <laughs> talk that much about it, in England, there was a crisis during the Industrial Revolution involving small change or token coins. Here you see a slide showing the kind of copper uh, uh, half pennies that were being produced by the government. Well, the first column is a, a copper half penny in good condition, and the engraving quality is nothing to write home about. Second is a worn one, which is more typical of what was actually available in circulation. You can imagine how easy it was to counter fit a worn official coin. The government didn't uh, routinely withdraw the worn coins from circulation and so invited heavy counterfeiting. It also did that, by the way, by making gold coins available only in the London Tower Mint. No matter where you were in the country, you had to come to London for your small coins. And you had to pay the full face value of the coins, even though they were token coins and cost much less than that to produce. 
Imagine the temptation to do business with a counterfeiter if you were a factory owner in Birmingham or uh, in some further away place. It was overwhelming. But of course, there were, uh, uh, there were extreme difficulties created by all this counterfeit money. The government wouldn't do anything about it, so finally what happened was a private minting, a, a bunch of private mints that were legitimate mints sprung up. Instead of producing counterfeits, they produced custom coins for tradesmen to issue under their own names. And these coins were highly counterfeit resistant. Why? Because to get them into circulation, the tradesmen offered to redeem them like so many paper IOUs in real money, gold or silver as the case might be. And as you can see from this specimen, one of many beautiful examples, engraving is superlative. The best engravers in the country were used. These private coins saved the British Industrial Revolution from what would have been a, star a starvation of the payment system for want of small change from the official sources. And yet, the private minting industry that flourished during the Industrial Revolution was ultimately uh, uh, destroyed by government intervention, even though at the time the government barely knew how to get its own coinage act in, in, in order. It ultimately figured out how to do it kind of well by copying procedures the private minting industry had pioneered. The shoddy quality of government coins is really why we ended up with something called banks and bank money. It was mainly due to the awkwardness of dealing with uh, coinage systems where coins were shoddy, clipped, worn, otherwise impaired, that was what inspired the creation of the first modern banks. Most people are familiar with the Bank of Amsterdam, which was set up by the government and was uniquely or uh, one of the few cases of a bank that had 100% reserves or was supposed to. In fact, it didn't stick to that rule. Uh, and the bank's IOUs did serve as a kind of money, but they weren't true circulating IOUs. There was a commission charged both ways, so it wasn't really a modern case of true bank money. What you may not know about this episode is that the only reason this bank existed was because of, a, uh, of a, uh, the law that created it outlawed private rivals to this bank that might otherwise have flourished, including all fractional reserve alternatives. But if we want to know the real origins of modern bank money, we have to look to the case of England and the famous goldsmiths of Lombard Street and, and nearby areas. They were the first to really issue convenient substitutes for coin that could be used in exchange, including the first bank notes, what were called at the time running cash notes. And the goldsmith bankers operated from the very beginning on a fractional reserve basis. That's not a coincidence. It's absolutely essential. Here's why. Suppose you have a warehouse bank, that is, a bank operating on 100% reserves. How can it issue circulating paper IOUs? Remember, to circulate, the IOUs have to be able to pass anonymously from hand to hand. But a 100% reserve institution is really like a warehouse. It has to ch charge storage fees because it's not earning any interest on, by lending money deposits. So how can you charge storage fees to the owners of gold who you cannot identify or track? Impossible. Circulating bank money implies fractional reserves. This is something that certain Austrian economists need to be reminded of. This is an early goldsmith's note. Mary, uh, sorry, and this, this is a modern bank note. Uh, uh, sorry, this is a somewhat later bank note. This was one of the earliest bank notes from the Scottish banking system, from the Royal Bank of Scotland, which would become one of the great examples of a flourishing, mostly free, unregulated banking system. I'll say more about it in a moment. But I do want to return to the question of fractional reserves. Within the Austrian school, the followers of Murray Rothbard in particular have made a lot of hate trying to claim that fractional reserve banking is inherently fraudulent. 
Their claim is if you bring gold to a bank in the old days, certainly, but even in modern times, people were under the impression that they were just storing the stuff, and when banks actually lent much of the money handed over to them, that they were engaged in fraud. They were betraying their customers. There's no truth to that at all. We know, first of all, that even those early goldsmith banks were paying interest on their deposits. It takes a naive depositor to imagine that he's getting storage fees and a lot more than that because these banks provided all kinds of accounting services. They really, besides having to deal with the pesky coins and sort them and all that, they were providing lots of services and certainly had to cover the costs. How could they pay interest if they were merely storing coins? Uh, but there's more to the response than that. There's a, oops, there's a long tradition in the history of money and monetary exchange, and this held with the goldsmiths as well, and had become the basis for all modern banking law. If you brought coins to a bank that were loose, the assumption was that they were being rendered to the banker to become the banker's property, and you got a debt contract for that, an IOU, which was a promise to pay, but not a bailment or storage contract. It was perfectly possible, on the other hand, to have a storage agreement, but in that case you brought your money sealed, and the idea is that the seal, a sealed bag, would remain unbroken. And so, sealed money, storage contract. Loose money, debt contract. Very simple. Very simple. So, anyone who wanted to have their money stored certainly could, and they knew what they had to do, but if they didn't, if they'd rather have the interest and services that went along with the fact that banks could lend their money, well, then they, they handed it over loose. And then they didn't expect to get the same coins back, of course. Adam Smith remains, in my opinion, the scholar who best understood the advantages as well as some of the risks involved in fractional reserve banking. I commend to you all his uh, second book, second chapter on money, where he talks about the advantages of fractional reserve banking uh, in a manner that has not been surpassed ever since. Particularly, he compares it to a highway in the sky. The metaphor is a little difficult to grasp at first, but think of it this way. Suppose you, the, that the only good you cared about was wheat, or what Smith would have called corn and you've got a certain amount of acreage. You could plant the entire acreage with corn. The problem is then you can't harvest the corn because you need a, a road, a wagon way through the field so you can get to the corn. That means sacrificing some of the acreage. What if you could have a highway suspended in the sky? Then you could harvest from the air. Think of air combines or whatever, right? He said money, fractional reserve-based money is like that. If you have to use gold, you're using resources to produce the gold, to coin it, that could go to produce other things. If instead you use back bank IOUs instead of the gold, where the IOUs are backed by a relatively small amount, you don't need the gold itself. You can invest the resources you would have put into the gold, have the advantages of money without the opportunity costs. I'm going to go a little bit faster so we have time for uh, questions, but so he's really arguing about reducing the cost involved in having a monetary standard. Now, the Scottish system, which Smith, of course, which informed Smith's ideas, I've mentioned that it was really an important example, and that's because, unlike the case in other countries, Scotland never set up a central bank, a monopoly bank of issue. At least it didn't do so. Even, even to this day, it has no monopoly, though it has whittled away at competition since 1845. So you had a system with competing banks of issue. They all issued notes denominated in, in pounds and shillings and so on, but they competed with each other, issuing these standard notes. I'm going to talk more about the implications of that for stability later on. Suffice for me to introduce the idea now by saying that this system put a strict discipline on all the Scottish banks, making them analogous to members of a chain gang where no bank could easily get out of line lending too generously without being tripped up. I'll talk about that later so we don't have to go into it now, but one of its effects was to stabilize spending in the Scottish system and prevent the system from getting much out of line, both 
with respect to internal and with respect to international equilibrium. I'll talk about that later, so we'll skip by. Here's an example of a system that doesn't do it. <laughs> That's what happened in the recent crisis. Um, Smith acknowledged that uh, a fractional reserve banking system, one that's allowed to freely develop like Scotland's, contains an, a risk, right? If people lose confidence in the banks, now you could have some real trouble. And that's especially obvious in a case like the Scottish case, where bank reserve ratios, the actual gold or silver reserves, could be as low as 1%, 2% of liabilities. The fact is, though, that the Scottish system was remarkably crisis-free and that very little money was lost by Scottish note holders and depositors over the course of the hundred years or so when this arrangement flourished. Moreover, until 1765, when they were outlawed, Scottish banks had resort to a special kind of note called option clause notes that gave them the option of temporarily suspending payment in the event that there was a raid or run on their reserves that could have shut them down even if they were solvent. Now here's the thing you have to understand about these notes. The amount of interest the banks had to pay if they exercised the option was such that they never had an incentive to exercise it if they were in fact insolvent. They were just shut down. But if they were solvent, it was worth suspending and paying the interest because People would calm down and eventually they'd find out that the banks were sound. In fact, the contract was so designed that as soon as a bank invoked it, everyone had reason to calm down and go home because they wouldn't invoke it unless they were solvent. Unfortunately, they were outlawed. I could talk more about this later on. Well, I'd like to say a lot more, of course, about how banking can flourish and how many of the most reliable and sound banking and monetary institutions developed, in fact, thanks to free market forces. And alternatively, I'd like to tell you a lot more about how government intervention has undermined uh, uh, private innovation in money and banking. This is an example of M-Pesa, which is a private money that's been flourishing. You use cell phones to make payments in parts of Africa. Monetary innovation still goes on today in all sorts of ways despite the tremendous intrusion of governments that has undermined the stability and efficiency of monetary systems the world over, I could give you, and I will give you, another, another lecture that talks about some of the ways in which government interventions undermine monetary stability. That will be my lecture tomorrow on the destabilizing consequences of central banking. But let me assure you, as I used to assure my students in class, you cannot tell a story of any banking and monetary or monetary crisis, whether recent or in the distant past, and tell it well without appealing to the role of misguided government interference. Monetary stability is what the market naturally produces, monetary innovation as well, and efficiency, crises, damage, inefficiency, losses, these are what governments bring to the story of money. Thank you very much. I've purposely left time for plenty of questions because uh, in my experience this, this talk generates plenty, so um, please uh, proceed. I think this mic isn't working properly, is it? Can you all hear the question? Yeah. Now so, it is. Yeah. Get close so, to so, the mic. So on the, on the last slide, I was hoping that you would say a couple of words about Bitcoin and yeah, cryptocurrencies, yeah. but as you were not, so that's the question. Thank you. So uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is an example of one of those monetary innovations that uh, is still going on. Uh, markets, sometimes because of regulation, are continuing to make pioneering, uh, engage in pioneering uh, experiments regarding money. Now, Bitcoin, it should be said, from the, from, uh, 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 for, for starters, Bitcoin isn't money by any standard economics definition, because to be money, it would have to be a generally accepted medium of exchange. But it has been moving in that direction since its establishment uh, several years ago, about five, six years ago. Uh, 
It's a fascinating development. The t technology behind it is hardly worth uh, attempting to go into in any detail. Suffice to say that it's a development that came as a surprise to many monetary economists, myself included, because our understanding of the evolution of money and, uh, in free markets has always been, like Menger's, based on the assumption that it must start with a commodity that has some non-monetary value. Otherwise, it's just not going to be in that Mengerian horse race, right? If, you, if you're gambling or I'm gambling on, try, on finding a good that's more easy to trade for what I really want, I'm not going to choose something that I don't think anybody wants, right? And neither are you. Bitcoin sure looked like something nobody should want, at least on paper. What did you do with it if you didn't know it was widely accepted? What could you do with it? The best stories I've heard about how Bitcoin managed to get a foothold and then eventually to, to become more and more popular in exchange uh, relates to basically con computer geeks playing with the stuff and treating it more or less... It was like, imagine you had a Monopoly game and you're playing with the Monopoly money and then you discover that this stuff that you're just using like chips to keep track of things has certain features that make it actually advantageous to other established exchange media. Well, it does have a use value now. It's game money. That's a use. That has value. And so that's enough to give a foothold. And once people discovered the anonymity advantages and, and all that, that foothold uh, became a, a bigger foothold in the world of underground uh, purchasing and that sort of thing. And uh, the, the, the process then could spread, according to the standard Mengarian theory, to the point where there are now many, many thousands of merchants who accept Bitcoin uh, in exchange. So potentially this could ultimately cross the ill-defined line between a, a mere medium of exchange and a generally accepted one. It's quite possible. Let me say one more thing about Bitcoin. To me, it, it represents not one experiment, but a potential set of experiments. Bitcoin has features of a commodity money and features of a fiat money, and the features are the good ones from each. What do I mean? Well, with a standard commodity money, like gold, one of the big complaints, not a very valid complaint, uh, that is, it's a potential problem, but it historically wasn't a very real problem, is that monetary stability could be disturbed by discoveries of new gold sources or by changes in fashion that made gold jewelry more or less popular. And that's true of any commodity that has other uses and that's naturally occurring and so can be found. Uh, you can have surprises. With Bitcoin, you have a process that resembles mining of the stuff, but the actual amount of mining or the actual production schedule is predetermined. It's a smoothly rising curve that tapers off at 21 million coins. So there will be no Bitcoin discoveries in that sense. There'll be no disruption of its value because of that sort of thing or because Bitcoin will be popular as jewelry or what have you. So uh, it has the advantage of inherent scarcity because nobody can make it less scarce. That's all built into the pre-established protocol. But there are no supply surprises or demand surprises. Very nice. Uh, in contrast, though, it, it has uh, 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 fiat money, avoids the supply surprises, but is subject to arbitrary manipulation. And we all know where that can end up going. So I think this is very important. Now, Bitcoin's protocol, with, with its 21 million limit, is only one of a practically infinite variety of different protocols that we could have for similar cryptocurrencies in the future, including some that involve feedback from economic activity so that you could have a very smart example of a cryptocurrency. I call them, by the way, synthetic commodity monies, these kinds of, this class of money, and neither fiat nor true commodity, commodities, where the protocol that determines how the supply behaves is smarter than any central banker could possibly be and more reliable. And this, to me, is a fascinating prospect. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no worries. Um,
So, so we, you talked a lot about all the things um, government shouldn't be doing in relation to money. Um, what would its proper role be? Is it just anti-fraud and contract enforcement, or does it have something special that it ought to be doing in relation to money? Honestly, I can think of nothing that governments need to do with money except keep out. If they are indeed uh, held responsible for protecting people against fraud, and for making sure contracts are honored as written, then of course governments should do those things. This is assuming you don't have a private court system to handle those things. But as for any special regulations that governments need to impose and enforce in order to have a sound monetary system, I honestly can't think of any. Uh, there, there, now, that's true if you've let markets evolve spontaneously from the get-go. That's a different, that there's a different question. It says, do governments have to do anything now to get our monetary systems in order? And unfortunately, the answer to that question is yes. Because uh, of the same network effects, the same snowballing characteristics that Menger's theory uh, uh, de uh, describes, once you have a form of money in place, it's very difficult for others to successfully compete with it. As I said, Bitcoin has made some inroads, but it's still very small. Uh, so in the meantime, for example, here we are stuck with the fiat US dollar, which has established such a huge network, right? Of course, it, the way it got established was by first being convertible into gold and then having the government pull the, the rug out, okay? So here we are holding fiat money. Uh, and and uh, the problem is that in order to if we don't want to give up on the dollar, we can't expect it to just be spontaneously reformed. It is, like it or not, it has a scarcity that depends utterly on how it's managed by the central bank. We've got to do something with that institution, and it's going to take legislation of some kind to make the dollar a reliable money. Uh, we, can, we can hope that something else takes it place, but we'll, we'll be waiting perhaps a long time, and who knows what the dollar will be doing while we're stuck holding uh, dollars. So legislation isn't necessary to create a good monetary system, but it may be necessary to fix a bad one. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, they switch sides? Okay. Yeah. Um, as you were speaking about uh, Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you mentioned was anonymity that uh, uh, Bitcoin, I guess there are a lot of people that believe that uh, Bitcoin provides. Um, and that's something that's a bit of a misconception. Um, are you familiar with any other cryptocurrencies or enhancements to Bitcoin that do provide that uh, anonymity? There, there are, Bitcoin isn't entirely anonymous, that's right. In fact, one of the principles of its operation is that every transaction has to have, as it were, a full provenance. Let me explain the sense in which Bitcoin is anonymous. Uh, it is anonymous relative to cash, which is the other notoriously anonymous exchange medium of those that are conventionally known, because you don't need face-to-face -face transacting. You can do it on a computer. Most transacting on a computer, uh, without, if you want to rely on digital monies other than Bitcoin, with the exception of some new ones that are out there, then your, your obvious choice is a wire transfer or send a check, whatever, right? You can do all these things electronically, but those are much less anonymous than Bitcoin. So it's the merging of, of digital money with something relatively anonymous, relatively hard to trace the identity of the transactors that made Bitcoin so appealing. Could it be even more anonymous? Could another kind of cryptocurrency beat uh, Bitcoin on that score? And the answer is yes, people are working on those and there are some out there al already that have features precisely aimed at making the anonymity uh, 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 complete so that you have full anonymity of cash transactions and yet no face-to-face -face contact. That's, that's out there as well, but it hasn't really caught on. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I think it's Menger, uh, and maybe Say, I read them at the same time, who argues 
that there should be no name, no concept for a national currency. So no dollar, no franc, no mark, simply weights of gold. I myself am very attracted to that. What do you think about that argument? Well, uh, it sounds good, but it doesn't work. And we know that because what happens is the word, the word that starts out referring to a certain weight of something, like pound or leave, ends up acquiring a new meaning by virtue of uh, uh, governments uh, being able to manipulate the standard. So now, of course, there's still such a thing as the pound sterling. But it has nothing to do with sterling, and it has nothing to do with the pound weight. So the name itself can't serve as a sufficient uh, guarantee that the, the unit of money will not be divorced from some, unit, some fixed unit of metal. We know that that won't it suffice. Does, did it help a little? Maybe. But we know it's not enough. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason to believe that if we were to just let uh, currency um, happen spontaneously, that it would stop? Uh, is there a possibility that it would just continuously evolve? And oh. is there a problem with that if, there, if it did? No, I think it would continually evolve. I, I think that there would always be innovation. The network tendencies that I've been harping on uh, tend to reinforce an existing standard, but they don't stop innovation with substitutes for standard money, for example. Uh, that would certainly continue. And uh, there may even still be some opportunities for modification of the standard. But modification of the standard is much less likely to continue once established, once the standard is established under a market-based system. Standards tend to be reinforcing. Now, there can be exceptions to that. We all know the stories about, you know, uh, VHS and Betamax, etc. Entrepreneurs should never be uh, underestimated in their capacity to, to change things, even when those things seem absolutely rooted. Uh, so it would be wrong of me to suggest that even a widely established monetary standard would necessarily pre prevail forever in a completely free market. Uh, but, of course, there are powerful forces favoring its survival, and therefore it takes a heck of a lot of entrepreneurial ingenuity to change it. If it did change, I would suppose it would be changing for the better. Uh, because for entrepreneurs to succeed in es establishing a new standard in the face of an existing one that's actually superior is a lot harder. Uh, I, I, but I <laughs> will get into a debate about the virtues of VHS, VHS and Betamax, I suppose we continue. But, but anyway, that innovation never stops. One of the virtues of a free market in money is precisely that it never pretends to have permanently solved any monetary problem. And therefore, it avoids what Israel Kirzner calls the perils of regulation, which include having a permanent a solution that can therefore uh, not be expected to be the best solution for very long, and that eventually becomes a very bad solution. Thank you. We have the uh, Greece crisis going on right now. Mm -hmm. If you were a son over there, how would you advise them? If I were what? Sent to Greece, and they asked you to advise them, how would you unwind this thing? Yeah, I'd say go back and vote again, for starters. Um, <laughs> um, the be one thing Greece could do, I, 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 uh, the politics here are dicey, but if I had been able to advise them in anticipation, I would have said, uh, I, there's talk that they've already printed up drachma notes. I think that's probably, a, uh, 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 that's going to be a mess. They should have printed up a bunch of, of uh, euro notes, as liabilities of either the government or the individual banks, preferably the latter. Uh, or, or rather, they should have authorized banks, both foreign and, and domestic, to print up euro notes that they could issue while continuing to suspend payments of euros for as long as the crisis uh, continued, if they had to, so as to allow the banks to stay open with checks, with these notes circulating in place of uh, euros that are presently unavailable, and with checks being acceptable through the clearing system so that people could continue to make necessary purchases and expenditures while uh, the prospect of renewed talks with the uh, 
European authority was still uh, in play. Who knows when it'll not be in play. That would have been my practical advice to them, uh, because right now they're in dire straits. There are many, many people who you know, have nothing but the euros that they were lucky to withdraw, if, if any, to uh, provide for their needs in the immediate future, and that's a terrible situation. Let me tell you what this information advice is coming, where it's coming from. <clears throat> in 1933, when the run on the dollar led to the closing of the banks, the National Bank holiday, that, uh, that holiday, which lasted uh, uh, almost a week, was very painful because no one could pay anything for anything. If they didn't already have cash on hand, they, they were shut out of the payments uh, system. You couldn't write a check or anything. And uh, the, the private banks of New York, the clearinghouse of New York, had advised the government, the Fed. They said, look, in 1907, we did a restriction of payments. We issued emergency currency, which is like the notes I'm talking about. And we were able to keep pay the payment system functioning, even though we weren't letting people take out gold. And it, it, it's much better than what you're proposing to do. The Fed said, get lost. We're in charge now. We know what we're doing. And, and of course, the, the result was a lot more misery. So that would be my practical advice to them. But I mean, look, that, that's if they want to have uh, uh, less chaos. The euro, of course, is another problem. I mean, the euro was a mess from the beginning. The incentives created uh, uh, were very bad ones. Up until 2003, you could hope that the safeguards that had been put into place to prevent what actually happened from happening might have worked. But then when Germany and France both violated the Growth and Stability uh, Pact and were not punished in any way, then uh, that, was the, that was the handwriting on the wall that this system was not going to function as it was supposed to and that any renegade economy could end up holding it hostage. The fact that Merkel and others uh, were determined to keep the Eurozone together by hook or by crook meant, of course, that uh, uh, a hostage taking uh, was all the more likely, and that's exactly what happened to Greece, with Greece. Yes? Um, isn't it a real risk, um, or maybe inevitable, that the U.S. ultimately will default? Um, we're talking about irredeemable currency, no intention or means to pay the debt. Aren't we moving towards a cliff? No, not eminently, but eventually? Well, unfortunately, the two things, the two facts that you've mentioned in some ways are, are, are contrary because uh, precisely because we have an irredeemable fiat currency, uh, it's always possible for the government to avoid defaulting because the bonds that it issues are bonds payable in irredeemable currency, which it can issue in unlimited amounts. There's no statutory limit. It's all up to Janet Yellen or whoever happens to be in charge of the Fed and, and, uh, and that person's FOMC colleagues. So uh, it's precisely the problem with a fiat irredeemable currency that it can be an escape uh, a route for a government that might otherwise not be able to pay its debt, the escape being inflationary finance, where the debt is simply monetized. And that so if we didn't have fiat money, then we would be more likely to face uh, an eventual reckoning where a default uh, would be the only way out, or the only potential end. So um, uh, we have to worry less about default because we have to worry more about inflation. So I'm interested in your thought about uh, U.S. dollar being used as the reserve uh, currency. Uh, so how did that come about? Was it uh, fundamentally good in some way, or was it just that it was popular and ubiquitous and you know, easily accessible, um, or there was something else to it? And uh, also in the future, you know, what, uh, what about this idea that it might lose its uh, reserve currency status? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, let me answer the last part first. Uh, of course, there's nothing to guarantee that the dollar will remain the preferred international reserve currency. Uh, sterling was once the international reserve currency. Uh, the dollar ultimately displaced it. The talk not long ago was that the Chinese yuan would, would be the big, was posed a, an eventual threat to the dollar. Well, uh, 
uh, given what's happening in China right now, I think that that's a less imminent threat than, than it was even before, and it wasn't so imminent then. So uh, uh, I see nothing in the immediate prospects to unseat the dollar from its role, though I don't deny that th this could happen. But remember that the dollar's popularity, and this gets to your first question, is a matter of how it, it stacks up relative to the available alternatives, and the available alternatives are, for the most part, worse. Nobody is betting on the euro right now being, uh, becoming a, a better currency. On the contrary, it's, uh, it's, likely to be, it's more likely to fall apart. And so the dollar wins by default in this contest. Uh, now, it also wins as a choice for a currency for a country that uh, doesn't want to go it alone. So if you're a country that uh, doesn't trust its own monetary authorities to manage an independent currency, and there are many countries that can't, that, whose governments certainly can't be trusted in that respect, then uh, you're better off uh, accepting the dollar with all its faults than risking having your own worse fiat money. And that's the decision that has driven uh, Ecuador, for example, to dollarize. And by the way, the countries that have dollarized have done very well, including in the recent crisis. Uh, dollarization and euroization are very different. And they're different in a way that the Eurocrats misunderstand. Uh, because when dollarization happens unilaterally, as it did in Ecuador, there's no, there's no uh, assuming, there's no presumption that the Federal Reserve is going to in any way be responsible for any crisis in the dollarized country. The Fed could care less what happened to Ecuador. It's not our problem, that is, the Fed's. And what does that mean? Well, the Eurocrats would say, oh, isn't it terrible, you know? Those poor Ecuadorians don't get to vote on how the dollar is managed. They're not going to, they're going to be, you know, uh, on their own if they have any crisis. Yes, that's one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is they'll have to behave themselves and be responsible for not having crises and for not going too heavily into debt. And that's what happens. So, uh, I, I, back in 1991, when I was advising some of the Baltic uh, uh, um, economies, I wrote a Wall Street Journal article saying that they should set up currency boards and issue their own euro-denominated notes, issue notes before there was an ECB issuing those notes. And I've since argued that the best plan for being on the euro is to be on the euro without being part of the official eurozone. Just do it unilaterally. I advised Scotland that way. I mean, I advised it, not officially, but I wrote, the, Scot the Scottish people can, can join the, uh, uh, sorry, in that case, I wrote, they can issue their own pound notes as they do. They don't need the help of the Bank of England. What? They can't count on the Bank of England for bailouts? Good. That'll make for a better Scottish system. Not unlike, perhaps, the system that uh, existed over a century uh, uh, or more uh, uh, ago. So. So um, the, uh, it's always possible to use another country's currency, and if it, it can be a, a good bet to do it. What you don't want is to officially use another country's currency and put yourself in a position where you think you can uh, blackmail some other central bank into being responsible for your own poor fiscal and banking decisions. But that's what... Greece did, of course, and that's what countries on the Eurozone, in the Eurozone periphery, are inclined to do. Can you comment on how important the supply or increasing supply of money is? Uh, this, you made me think of this when you said Bitcoin does, in fact, have an upper ceiling of issuance. I've heard it also argued that an advantage of gold is that it has a continuing, basically, you can expect it to always have more gold discovered. So is that a problem with Bitcoin or I, any other currency? I think it is. I think it is. I'm in the unfortunate situation of being one of a dozen people in the world who are reasonable when it comes to deflation. <laughs> Which means that I, I, don't, I don't think 
deflation, any amount of deflation, is always just fine, as some of my Austrian friends claim. But I don't think deflation is always bad, and I've written about this. Um, the kind of deflation that's fine is the kind that's driven by greater productivity of the economy. So when you have a more productive economy, your goods are costing less per unit to produce. And there's no problem with their prices reflecting that decline in cost of production because, well, if the selling price is only falling as much as the cost of production, nobody's the worse for it. That's, you know, that's Econ 100. Except most macroeconomists don't get that, and they talk about deflation as if it's always bad. However, there's another kind of deflation, which happens when people stop spending. Now, that's bad, because now what's causing prices to fall is the fact that producers, sellers, uh, are forced to lower them, or to at least consider lowering them, for want of demand. You know, they, they won't be able to sell anything if they don't lower the price, or they won't sell it. But they can't recoup their expenditures anyway, because they're either making less per unit than they would have expended on it in, at the margin, or they're not selling, or they're making less by not selling as many units, right? So, so that kind of deflation is harmful. Now, um, this gets back to the question of gold versus Bitcoin. Under the gold standard, it so happens that we had a tendency in the very long run for prices actually to uh, be mean reverting. So in the long run, the price level is constant. But for long periods pending new gold discoveries, there would be deflation. For example, 1873 to 1896, you have deflation, you know, 1.6% average per year. But it wasn't com far out of line with the rate of productivity growth at the time. So although certain sectors of the economy felt pinched, uh, you, didn't have, you didn't have a depression that lasted from 1873 to 1896. Footnote, some people claim there was a depression then. You know how they were making that argument? By defining a depression as a period when prices are falling. If you don't make that jump, then you can't find evidence of a long depression. All right? that's, that's how confused some economists are about deflation and depression. So anyway, Bitcoin, we've never had a base standard money, the supply of which couldn't grow at all. And it's hard to see how in a, an economy where population's growing, there's more factor inputs, you're going to end up with some bad deflation in that case because you're going to have uh, uh, increases in the real demand for money uh, unrelated to productivity growth that cannot be compensated by growth in the nominal supply. And that, that's bad deflation, too. Thanks. Oh, yes, we're out of time. That was it. Thank you very much.